please start recording. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Salto School District Board of Trustees. A recording and or broadcast of this meeting is being made at the direction of the board, and the recording and or broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. I'll now take the roll. Vladimir Ivanovich. Here. Steve Taglia. Here. Jessica Spicer. Here. Brian Johnson. Here. And I wish Ellie Sirkin here as well. Can all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. Would any board members like to provide comment on tonight's agenda? Please, may I please have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? I so move. Thank you, Jessica. Oh, thank you, Vladimir. <laughs> <laughs> Motion to approve tonight's agenda was made by Jessica and seconded by Vladimir. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Closed session report. No action was taken in closed session tonight. Superintendent's update, Mr. Baird. Yes, good evening. Um, I don't have any update for you this evening. Just, uh, just letting you know that we are uh, working hard for the, uh, the calendar year here, and um, a great last week of school for uh, the break that I know students and staff are looking forward to. Thank you. We'll now move on to our annual organization. We'll start with the election of president. May I have a nomination for president? Nominate Steve for president. Thank you, Jessica. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Vladimir. Any board discussion on Steve's candidacy? Writing was thanks. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Seeing none. Uh, motion to nominate, uh, or to, elect. to elect, I'm sorry, to elect Steve as president was made by Jessica, seconded by Vladimir. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you. Election of vice president. May I have a nomination for vice president? Thank you, Steve. Uh, may I have sorry, a second? You don't <laughs> <laughs> have to be See? louder if you're president. <laughs> Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Vladimir. Any board discussion? Okay, motion to elect Jessica as uh, vice president was made by Steve and seconded by Vladimir. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, next, moving on election of clerk. May I have a nomination for clerk? I'd like to nominate. Can I nominate? I'd like to nominate Brian. Can I have a second? Second. I'm going to give it to Vladimir to go for it. Uh, any board discussion? Okay. Motion to nominate uh, Brian for clerk was made by Wei Shelley and uh, <laughs> seconded by Vladimir. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Great. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, Brian. Uh, board members, can you please move to your new seats? <laughs> Here, you want to give me my name, Brian? You take yours. Okay. Are we ready? Okay. So let's uh, pick up where we left off. 
the 2022 board procedures. Um, we, I think they've been including your packet. Kind of thing for check. It didn't say anything unique there, but do you have a motion to approve the 2022 board procedures? So moved. Second. So I have a motion from Brian, second from Jessica. Any discussion on the procedures? Changes, concerns? Not hearing any. Can we go to a vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? No. So it passes. Thank you very much. And then committee and appointments um, you have in front of you um, a, a list of proposed uh, assignments for next year. Take a look at that. We have to let those air out for the next cycle. If you have any questions, concerns you want to raise now or later with Jeff, let me know. We'll bring them back to next month if the I think that's it. January 10th, we'll bring it back up. Okay, moving on to section F, consent count. Can I get quick comments? Yep, here? go for it. I just wanted to uh, thank Sholly for yeah. her service last year. Um, it was a most unusual year, yeah. uh, entirely uh, virtual as, as president. And I uh, just wanted to, to thank you for, for leading our, our district through. Uh, to a, a fairly crazy time. Yep. Second. Yeah. <laughs> Third. Thanks. <laughs> Let's try and move this along for Shelly's sake. Right. We'll <laughs> Is it for Shelly's sake? It was for Shelly's sake. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't play. Um, consent calendar. Uh, moving on to four. We have consent calendar. Can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? So, so moved. Uh, <laughs> second. Brian. Okay, Shelly. Brian. Okay, did you ask for discussion? I mean, discussion is going to happen now. Can I, is anybody have anything they'd like to discuss? Hearing none, can we move into a vote? All in favor? Aye. Great. That's just five votes. Now we've got boys uh, with a uh, chance to address the board. Uh, is Kate on? Great. Kate, you want to go ahead? You've got uh, three minutes. Or I'm here. Good evening. Um, teachers are working hard and preparing to navigate the rainy days ahead this week, and we are wrapping up lots of exciting projects and activities as we near December break. As we head into the end of 2021 and prepare to launch into 2022, LATA would like to take this moment to express our recognition and gratitude for this community. First, we would like to thank our awesome Board of Trustees for their continued service and dedication to our Los Altos school community, and congratulations to our newly elected President Steve Taglio, Vice President Jessica Spicer, and Clerk Brian Johnson. We are looking forward to continuing to work together in the new year. LATA continues to value our close working relationship with the district and appreciates the steps the district office and awesome site administrators have taken to keep students and teachers safe and supported. We are also looking forward to hearing more about the opportunities presented by the Educator Effectiveness Fund later this evening. Similarly, a shout out to CSEA and their incredible efforts, which are so integral to our schools and to our wonderful student and parent community for their grace, flexibility, and continued support for our teachers. We hope that all of you have a rewarding and relaxing December break, and we are looking forward to seeing each other again in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to move on to key, uh, community comments. This time's reserved for. Uh, yep. There's still. Uh, yeah, I was going to split that. Oh, Elaine, Elaine's there. I'm sorry. I was told Elaine is. You would you like to address the board? I see Elaine in here. No. Yeah. Uh, she's there, but she's there. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Scene. No problem. Can we so we move on to community comments? This time is reserved for members of the public and employees to address the board on items that are not on the agenda. The board is not permitted to discuss or take action on non-agendized items, except to instruct the superintendent to review the matter further and report back to the board in subsequent meetings or place the matter on a future agenda. The board may take, uh, make a brief comment or ask clarifying questions. Anybody is requesting to do that? Okay. Let's skip one announcement to provide public comment on agenda item as we move to the, the main core of the agenda. Members of the public should raise their hand, uh, use their raise hand button. If using Zoom app or press 
star nine on your phone. Your name will be announced when it's your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please make sure your microphone is on. Requests received after public comment begins will not be accepted. So action item, discussion item number one, Assembly Bill 360 update. Yeah, so um, as you're aware, Assembly Bill 361 allows us to meet in this format um, as long as a couple of conditions are met, as long as there's still an existing state of emergency in the state of California, which there is under the governor's order. And uh, Santa Clara County Public Health Department continues to recommend uh, social distancing and video conferencing where possible. So both of those are met. So uh, the board, we're looking for a board affirmation of um, media conditions of Assembly Bill 361, and that will take us into January. Okay, any, any members of the public want to comment on this item, please raise your hand now. Are there any questions from the board about this? Um, give another second here. Not seeing any requests to address the board, so I'm going to close the public comment. Any board uh, members want to provide additional comment on this agenda item? So we need a motion to approve to affirm the conditions of Senate Bill 360 have been met in order to continue virtual meetings for the Los Angeles School District Board of Trustees for the next 30 days. Moved. Second. Moved by Vladimir, seconded by Shally. Any other comments, discussion? No? All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's this Bible. Thank you. Item two, COVID update, vaccine clinics and LASD outdoor masking. Jeff? Yes, wanted to um, bring back to the board an update uh, as we continue to navigate um, the pandemic and provide, as Kate highlighted, a safe opportunity for our students and staff on our campuses. Uh, these are our overall case counts since um, August 1, which we're calling the beginning of the school year. Uh, you can see they're still quite low. Um, we have had one or two cases uh, each of the past three or four weeks. So um, those are, again, the case counts are still uh, low. Um, those contacts are being handled well um, and pool testing continues to um, be moving along well with uh, not a large number of positive cases identified. Um, you can see here the, uh, the County case count. Um, this is uh, ticking up. This was from last week when the slides were prepared. Uh, case counts are ticking up just a bit. I think we're uh, around 240 uh, on a seven day rolling average in the counties, uh, 240 cases. Um, the, the case rate by vaccination um, is actually quite interesting. Um, that number, again, these numbers are from December 8th. When you look at the numbers, um, even two days later from December 10, which was Friday and the most current uh, over the weekend, the um, unvaccinated case rate was up around 84 per 100,000. And the, um, the vaccinated uh, was still down very low. And the overall was about 10 times lower um between the uh the the overall and the unvaccinated so vaccinations definitely uh, appear to be uh, doing doing their job so we're and we know that within the county there's a very high vaccination rate um and certainly within our own community the vaccination rate is very high as well uh, uh speaking of which um you're aware uh, we found out right before Thanksgiving and scrambled to assemble um, vaccination clinics at two of our schools, Almonds, uh, and these are open to everyone and anyone in the county. Um, uh, it's, it's a Pfizer uh, is the vaccine they're using, but they're open for first, second, or booster um, shots up to any age. Almonds took place last Thursday. Um, Santa Rita's is actually today and just wrapping up. Um, each of those clinics has a corresponding second dose clinic. Um, Santa Rita's, I believe, is the third, the first day back um, from the holiday break, and Almonds is later that week. 
So those appointments are all being scheduled as people complete their first uh, first doses. So we, um, I know I spoke to Raquel, the principal, Raquel Mataroli, the principal at Allman, and said there was a, a, a steady stream of people uh, last Thursday. I'm checking with Kelly about uh, Santa Rita today. Um, but those are going well. We were appreciative of the partnership with Santa Clara County Public Health Department uh, to make this happen. So very positive. Um, outdoor masking, uh, last time we met, we were going to shift to outdoor masks being strongly recommended, but uh, optional, um, matching the state's guidelines and the county's guidelines. Uh, that took place December 6th, which was last, a week ago, um, at the junior high schools. Uh, that went well. Uh, still a high, high percentage of, of people wearing masks. Um, you know, probably in the mid to high 90%, um, the principals reported. We will look to do the same um, a week after we get back at the elementary, uh, at the elementary level. But reports are that um, it's going well and that people are still largely choosing to mask. Absolutely. All right, any questions? <clears throat> Yeah, just a quick one. Um, on the days, the appointment days for the second shot, will boosters be available or is it just yes. appointment days? Okay. Yep. Uh, and so not boosters, but no like first shots? I'm just curious. I think technically they will give you a first shot. Okay. And then they'll, then they will just put you somewhere give else. you an appointment somewhere else in the county for the second. Okay, thank you. Just, just to confirm, no appointments. No yes, appointments. Purely walk out. That's wonderful. Uh, quick comment. Yep. The national case rate, 14 day change is up 49%. Um, the hospitalization rate is up 22%. And the death rate is up 40% nationally. I just wanted to put it out there. If anybody wants to comment, please raise your hand now. Any other comments from board members on this? That's just a comment. I appreciate the information and the update. I think. I was hoping secretly that we would stop getting these updates by now, but I think as Vladimir points out, that's unlikely. So I'd like to request um, that's sort of one of the first slides, if we can start getting the number of cases in like the last two weeks, sure. rather than the total since August, since yep. the Delta, the changes are, are and sort of the current conditions are what people are going to be concerned with rather than yep. how many we've seen in the last six months. We can do that. Thank you. So the the New York Times reports a 14 week average, but the county reports a seven day, day. day average. So perhaps we want a seven day average, right? I think he's um seven or fourteen. I don't have a strong opinion. Okay. So you're talking about this, right? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um have we had any hospitalizations on those? Just do you know? No. Okay. You don't know. I don't I don't know. I okay. have not been told of any hospitalizations. Okay. Any other comments from the board members? I see no one's hand up for public comment, so I think we can move on. Educator assessment fund, uh, fund plan. Move on. Okay. So at our last board meeting, uh, I presented both in a slide deck and on a written plan. And so tonight I just have a very brief slide deck, but did attach the written plan again. Um, so as a quick reminder, we were allocated just under a million dollars to be used from now through the 25-26 school year. And it's really about professional learning for our staff and our comprehensive staff from teachers principals, administrators, to our classified staff and beyond. Uh, so we built uh, a plan that was shared with you last week um, to really be able to kind of fill in the gaps of what's missing within our program, within the services that we offer our students and families. Uh, our last meeting was a public hearing as required. This meeting is the meeting where you need to consider approval for the plan. The real um, required accountability is the expenditure reports that will go to the CDE each year. 
that I would expect that we will include a more programmatic uh, uh, report to the board to see how we are doing as well. I went to an LPAP training last Thursday and uh, by February 25th, I need to come to the board, I think it's by February 25th, with a mid-year update to our LPAP, which I think as I was starting to work on it last week, um, will just be informative for you to see where we, where we are with our goals. And it actually includes these additional pockets of money that have come since our LPAP was adopted last June. So it will give you that bigger picture of what's happening. Um, but tonight I am asking you uh, to consider approval of the plan and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. We're going to questions. So maybe Ms. Hubbard wants to comment on this agenda item. So raise your hands. Any questions? Um, thank you, Sandra. Um, I remember that there are recommendations from the LASD Equity Task Force on things they would like to see included in professional development. Yep. Will those be folded into? They certainly can be, but I think we've really budgeted for uh, that work. So I believe the recommendation from the Equity Task Force was around training around culturally responsive pedagogy mm -hmm. and developing some work around the anti-bias um, curriculum for, for students. And both of those pieces are in progress right now, I would say. So and already funded. Already funded, correct. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. I really appreciate that in our school district, equity is an action and not just something we absolutely talk right. about. So thank you for that. Yep. Okay. If that's any questions or hands raised from the public, so I close public comment. Any more board discussion on this item? Just a, a quick comment. Uh, I had mentioned last time that I didn't see explicitly called out principles, and I'm willing to, um, to wait and see how the actual plan works out oh, because I absolutely. noticed that the uh, largest chunk of money there also has uh, administration to it. Yep. Um, and I'm hoping that, that there is something explicitly done to help uh, principals, including, uh, I'm sure uh, Nadia has something to say about this, uh, the, uh, the uh, mental health of principals. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mental health is not the right way. way. The uh, disposition and the mood and the wellness. What? Wellness. Wellness, thank you. For principals. Yes, which was her doctoral research. Yes, yes, that's yeah, why. I, which I is why you're, I know. Yes, absolutely. Any other comments? This is an action item, so I'm going to need, uh, we're comfortable moving forward. I'm going to need a motion from the board to approve the educator effectiveness funding plan as presented. So Second. Great. I have a motion from Vladimir, a second from Shally. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Passes by vote. Yeah. And it's going back to Mr. McDonald again for the TK adopted math curriculum. Yeah, so I am really thrilled to be here tonight to share some of the work we've done since we last talk, talked about our math adoption back in the <coughs> spring. Uh, so wanted to remind you because it's been a while since we talked about we um, went through just about a two year process with cohorts of teachers with our curriculum council. Um, and then the last year we came to you in the springtime with a, a recommendation from the curriculum council to adopt the San Francisco Unified School District TK through fifth grade math curriculum. Um, and we love it for a whole bunch of reasons. But I wanted to let you know that um, this year that curriculum is being implemented in all our, our TK5 classrooms. We started before the school year began training teachers in mathematics and in the curriculum. We actually started last spring training our instructional support teachers, our IST coaches, knowing that their and our principals, knowing that their support will really be critical. So it's happening in all of our classrooms. They've been trained, teachers have been trained, but are receiving ongoing training and support, which I'll talk a little bit about tonight. Uh, so we've had two professional development days for teachers. Back in September, we actually uh, so often 
we love for teachers to have choice in their professional development when we run a PD day. But this particular day, we actually intentionally did not offer a lot of choice because we really wanted to make sure that some core elements as a follow up to our summer training were um, attended by all of our teachers. So all of our teachers attended a model lesson by our coaching team, our IST team, um, and spent about two hours going through as students and watching the moves uh, from teacher and it was really incredible and then had some time to plan um, after seeing that full real great model lesson. We also had an opportunity for our K2 teachers to attend a training on learning stations. It's really a, a component of the primary math program. Uh, there's a great kind of core program and then um, these additional learning stations that require just some extra prep and organization to make sure that that practice is really happening in our primary room. And then one of, this is just a taste of what teachers got, but one of the uh, best feedback we got was the session on the progression of fractions. So we had third, fourth, fifth grade teachers together in a room to talk about how the concept of fractions builds from third grade through fifth grade. It's a big foundational piece of um, higher mathematics. And I think it really allowed our teachers to see a much bigger picture from, you know, they might teach fourth grade, but really understanding what models that third graders learn, uh, the language that third graders learn and see where it's going in fifth grade and beyond um, was really great. And because of that, you'll see for our January Professional Development Day, this idea of progressions is growing because the teachers have really asked for more. So in January, our teachers will have lots of choice, which is great. And some of the math related PDs that we are offering, math fact fluency, we also, we certainly wanna make sure that our um, students are building fact fluency, which is much more than just memorizing their math facts. Um, you can see the other pieces there. We're doing a part two of the fraction progression, talking with um, our, uh, I think it's second to fourth grade teachers around multiplication and division and looking at that progression. Um, and even talking about that second one up there is actually from kinder through second grade, how counting leads to addition and beyond. So lots of opportunities. And as an aside, Shelly, one of the offerings on that January PD day will be um, a culturally responsive pedagogy house training as well that we're putting together. So there is great ongoing training. Our um, IST team has been real busy <laughs> this fall supporting teachers, working with principals um, in a variety of ways, but getting into to lots of classrooms and working with teachers to make, to make sure that our kids are getting the best version of math instruction that we can offer. <clears throat> um, and something that I often say to my team and to our greater team is that we remain a learning organization. And one of the pieces that we've invested in this year is for our principal leadership team and our coordinator team and our special education leadership team, our whole team, is this idea around doing some more formalized walkthroughs through our classrooms to look at the implementation of our new math program. So last week, uh, we really appreciated the teachers of Covington. We were able to get into every K-5 classroom, the whole team of, I don't know, 15 or 17 of us um, working with the Silicon Valley math, math Initiative we had a little overview as administrators beforehand. What are we going to be looking for? Um, what are the key tenants to our math program? And it was great to go into classrooms, um, to see what kids are learning and how they are learning, and then to be able to come back and talk a little bit about as educational leaders, what do we see and where do we need to grow? Um, so this is something we will be moving forward with here um, that we will be going to, I believe, two or three more schools as a whole team, but then all of the schools may get a smaller team as we break up and really have that opportunity to see what the math implementation looks like across our campuses. Um, we did not 
we never want to leave junior high school out. So we're also partner, partnering with the Silicon Valley Math Initiative to work with our junior high math departments. And they've already been through one cycle of coaching where they worked one-on-one -on -one with an SBMI coach and really did some goal setting, some learning together. They're learning on some of the um, similar strategies that are used in SF math really wanting one of the big focus areas is getting kids to talk more in our junior high math classes. So that's an area that they'll set some goals, they'll do some learning together. Uh, the teacher will go and teach and the coach will watch. Sometimes the coach does the modeling and the teacher will watch and then flip around that way and they have an opportunity to reflect on how it impacted student learning. So this is something ongoing that we'll be working with um, the junior high math for this school year, which is great. And really great feedback from the math departments that they've actually asked for more, which is terrific. Uh, so that's a little bit on our implementation and where we are here in December. But I also wanted to bring forward to you a bit of clarification because uh, there has been math in the news if you're paying attention a little bit. So I threw some screenshots up there from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there is a conversation happening around the new California math framework draft. So if we go here, before we get into kind of what the chatter is about, it's really important to understand the vocabulary because it's complicated. And as I talked to just a few parents about this, these things are getting conflated and somebody hears something and thinks it's everything when it's really not. So when we talk about a math pathway, you all are hopefully are all familiar with our own math pathways. We think of our pathways as courses over time, leading from fifth to sixth to seventh to eighth and into high school. And what is that particular course pathway? Curriculum, of course, is our set of lessons. Good curriculum builds over many years of similar language and vocabulary and strategies and practices. Um, and builds those skills. So those are the lessons that kids interact with. And then this framework is really what's been in the news. A framework is a guiding document that experts from within the particular practice, this one happens to be math, but every curricular area has a framework. It's really a guiding document that has a, an opinion about how that particular content area should be taught. And it's usually written by or drafted by a series of uh, practicing teachers, uh, university researchers in the area, and experts in the field. So those three things are important to know. So I'm just going to ask a question. Yes. Just when you say guiding document, I think I just want to be clear to make sure I understand. As far as I know, the state frameworks, in this case math, have no effect in terms of being no, required. Correct. For a particular district. Problem. Correct. It so really is a guiding document. Suggestions. They are suggestions, kind of the latest research or thinking um, and opinions, right? So, yes, we are not required to adopt and, and live by any particular framework. Um, so, when you go back to some of these news articles, I think it's fair to say that the two big concerns that are being raised within these articles. One is um, that the framework really does emphasize detracking in mathematics, that uh, until high school, the framework is currently recommending that students stay. So for us, that would mean all sixth graders in sixth grade math, all seventh graders in seventh grade math, all eighth graders in eighth grade math, and maybe in high school, you would begin to branch off. Um, there's concern that this is not um, supporting students who are very strong math learners and uh, accelerate and what have you. So one of the concerns or criticisms is around that idea of detracking. And the other is, well, I don't know, it's somewhat related. Um, but this idea that we're teaching social justice through math class, that math is how we're going to um, ensure that all students have an equitable experience. Uh, and at the bottom there's 
Brian was where I was trying to get that, that it really is just provided as guidance. As guidance. So when we think about these two concerns, I wanted to be really clear for you. Uh, these are our current math pathways, regardless of what the, the current framework or the next draft of the framework comes out. I feel personally strongly, and I think our data uh, holds strong as our students move through high school. Uh, I have no plans to, to change our math pathways. Uh, our students do incredibly well in uh, that sixth grade year, being able to have some options and even further options when they hit seventh grade. And we know that our students who get into algebra or geometry honors do very well by and large and exceedingly well as they transition into high school. So there is no, um, no plan to change that pathway moving forward. Uh, the second piece is this idea of that. Uh, Just to say yes. one more thing on the last. Yep. I, I think for an elementary district such as us, it's, it's important also to acknowledge and recognize the, the ecosystem we're working within, right? We're not working by ourselves. Our kids matriculate into a high school system. So it's really important that those two are working together. Absolutely. So the second concern raised around teaching social justice through math. Again, we don't have any plans to teach social justice through math. Uh, last spring, winter, I'm not sure of the time frame, uh, the board did adopt the um, teaching tolerance anti-bias framework, which has a series of social justice standards, and they fall within those four domains. Right now, we have a, a small group of cohort of teachers who are working through developing some lessons or trying lessons in their classroom and they are really right now standalone lessons like our project cornerstone lessons or our social emotional learning lessons um, we have no plans to teach this through math uh, there is some talk about where it might fit more naturally in content such as um, a reading or writing project or a social studies project but again, there's so much work to be done in this particular area. I think where the conflating comes together is the idea that some districts are stopping their pathways or changing their pathways is really about ensuring that all kids have access to higher level mathematics. Uh, I believe we can do that without detract detracting our math courses. So that's something, those are always numbers that we pay attention to of who is accessing our more accelerated math pathways. Um, yeah. So I don't remember if I had any, oh, some final thoughts. So uh, to take us back to our um, implementation of our math curriculum, this is probably, I know you've seen this figure before, but we feel really solid about the adoption of our math curriculum. Um, when a new framework is adopted, it is certainly something we will look at. Typically, the cycle of uh, materials, of curriculum materials, is a new framework is adopted, and then all of the publishers go and kind of retool their framework. And so at that time, and I think that's not now set for another three or four years, uh, we will certainly look at if we want a different um, curriculum adoption. But I will tell you that we feel strongly that our math program is really good for kids. It's so much more um, consistent across classrooms and across grade levels and schools. And what we love most about our curriculum is that it really hits the definition of rigor in mathematics. So we are not only doing procedural mathematics, but we're getting deeply into the conceptual understanding and the problem solving using the math to do interesting things with. Um, so we feel great about that. And I want our family to, to feel great about that. And I want you all to feel great about that, that we have selected a, a good curriculum for our students. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Let me just uh, uh, give, give the members of the public, they want to come on this to raise their hand now. 
for the chance while they're doing that. Any questions on the presentation before that? You weren't so excited. I know. I purposely <laughs> tried not to say those words because Randy gives me a hard time. <laughs> I do get very excited about that construction. Any other questions? I don't see anybody raising their hands either. I'll give you another second to do that for you too. We're going to close public comment. Any discussion with Sandra? Just to say thank you. Um, I think this is very useful to get out in front of this. As you say, it's been in the news. Yeah. Um, I like the fact, <clears throat> I appreciate the fact you ended on rigor as the goal of our math program. Absolutely. Especially because, I mean, for me, the most concerning thing I've seen in the articles about the state framework is the apparent lack of rigor behind the recommendations for detracking. Right. So I can't, as far as I can tell, nobody can figure out what evidence they have that detracking actually works beyond some extremely flawed data. Yeah. That also uh, comes out of San Francisco, which I think is why people get correct. confused. Right. Yep. That's exactly. what I was going to raise, mm -hmm. actually. Is it, could, you, could you actually touch on that San Francisco point? So San Francisco Unified School District has, I think there are several years into it now, two or three at least, where they did detrack their math pathways. And I think they were kind of a front runner in doing that to provide greater access. And um, within the framework, they're kind of called out as the, uh, you can follow this model um, for, for detracking in mathematics. But you know, just the last Friday, I believe Joe Bowler out of Stanford uh, created a podcast rebuttal to a lot of the news because she was a major author of the framework and really feels like it's the news has miscategorized what the intent and that it's uh, in her words sad that the, uh, the public narrative around it is really missing the key points. Um, so it, it's, yeah. But this is the problem that I have is that I think she's perhaps mistaken because the criticisms that I see that bother me is nobody's questioning the intent behind the policy. They're questioning the evidence that the policy serves the intent, that it actually works. And I, I'm, I'm afraid I see a lot of similarities to the controversy in San Francisco about renaming schools and some of the items that were included there that turned out to be based on bad information. Right. And so, I'm, as you said, we have no plans to do it, Correct. no matter what comes out of the framework. Correct. So it's a little bit neither here nor there, but yeah. uh, well, I just wanted Just today, Zaretta Hammond, who is the author um, who wrote The Culturally Responsive Pedagogy in the Brain, a really terrific book. Uh, her quote today around all of this was, uh, we don't need to water down curriculum. We actually need to water up curriculum and we need to up the level of rigor, um, especially after this pandemic when students have uh, potentially missed some um, really important years of learning. So I appreciated that, that stance. And I know we're on the same page. You're, you and your team have done a tremendous amount of work to gather evidence about what works and what doesn't work. And we will I know you and we will view any possible future changes through that lens as well. Sure. Any other discussions? Um, is the high school planning to make any changes in the way they do their math? Um, you know, one of the pieces of the framework recommendation, and so I have not talked to the high school about this specifically, but one of the pieces um, right now, kind of the acceptable college bound pathway goal is to get to calculus in high school. Uh, the, the framework believes that not all children need to get to calculus to be college ready or to have interest. And so there's a recommendation for a new pathway that around data sciences. Um, so I would not be surprised, but I do not know many school districts, um, high school districts are working to build a data sciences pathway that should be as equally as rigorous and much more relevant for students who are wanting to be college and career ready. So I, I know that our district is working on a math night for families. Um, and I think we have a meeting for an early January to get some details around that, but um, I, don't, I don't have any specific 
Um, I'm glad to hear that. I personally, computer world, I did five calculus classes in college for Andrew's now. Yeah. I'm trying to take it. statistics and probability. I just have a, a quick one. I, I just said it, I really appreciated the, the presentation. Just even even reading it, I was like, I now have something when parents ask those questions. This yeah. was this was perfect, and Great. and you, the the color you gave for the presentation. But now um, now we can help be on the front lines a little yeah. bit better. When people say San Francisco Unified, blah blah blah, I can point to the distinctions yeah. better. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the fifth item, first interim financial report. Randy? Yeah. Are you excited? excited. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, I guess I will this right. So um, this is an action item, and I'm going to uh, request that the board or recommend to the board that we do a positive certification that we can meet our financial obligations for the current year and the two future years. That's what this agenda item, the first item report is all about. And I'm going to spend a few slides just talking a little bit about why we are in such good financial footing, um, at least compared to more recent history, um, and uh, what's caused that. So next slide. So our reserves have grown primarily on uh, identifying four factors, a compounding effect of property tax growth over the last several years. Uh, our decline in enrollment uh, results in the need for fewer teachers, which results in less costs. During the pandemic, we've had uh, lower expenses on the expense side of our budget. Uh, Probably due to when we had schools closed, there were a number of things that were not happening, substitute teachers, et cetera. Identified those here. And then, as we've heard before, the COVID relief funds have helped, uh, have actually helped us offset some normal expenditures. So I have a little slide here showing, you know, kind of where we were and where we are now in terms of the growth uh, in our reserves. We did have high reserves just coming out of the Great Recession around 2012-13, primarily because of lots of bailout funding that came. We made lots of cuts. What's not on here is we also passed a parcel tax that brought in a little over two and a half million dollars starting in that first year there. So you can see the climbing reserves during the last couple of years here. So Couple slides on a couple of those factors: tax growth. Hopefully, you can see it better on your computer than up here in the little chart. But um, since 12, 13, 2012, 13, property tax collections have grown almost double what our total expenditures were: 66 percent versus 36 percent over that period of time. And in the last three years, you can see from the chart. The blue showing the tax growth versus um, the orange or brownish colored expense growth. 1% total growth on expenses in three years, whereas 22% in tax growth when you compound those three years. So it really does that compounding effect of tax growth. Tax growth makes a big difference. On the expense side, in having lower enrollment, you can see from the chart. As the number of teachers has declined, our revenues have gone up, right? Our reserve level has gone up. So, with all that as background, I just want to get into the actual details for the first interim. Uh, quick overview here uh, this first interim report incorporates the actual ending fund balance. Um, when we closed our books on last year, we didn't have that information in the adopted budget. So when we closed our books, we had a 19% reserve at the end of last year. And even after giving a 7% raise um, this year to employees, we are still maintaining close to a 19%, 17.7% reserves. Okay. Just a 
few slides about changes from the adopted budget to now. We can see the total revenue has gone up, primarily due to increased one time funding. This affects both the revenue and expense side. COVID funding was 1.9 million. An increase in net property tax revenues, gross tax revenues up, and also a decline in the BCS transfer of property taxes due to a lower enrollment than originally projected in the budget time. We have additional special ed funding and um, an increase in projected lottery funding based on the state's per student um, estimate for the current year. On the expense side, that too has gone up, of course. Um, one of the items here is the offset to the COVID funding, 1.9 million. The, we had a 2% Negotiated rate with our employees back in June when we adopted our budget. We've added a 5% raise since we in June. You know about that. That cost roughly 2.3 million. That's already incorporated in the expense projections. Uh, also, there is unspent program manager management money material that's been prior. You should note at the bottom that I have set aside as part of our annual balance a restriction or an assignment of our annual balance of $600,000 to cover that uh, requested cost for that teacher housing project and how often. So that's already built into the projection of the first day. Just a quick mention of our other funds besides our general operating fund. As you heard when we closed our books, we have a new fund, a student activity fund, where we're required now to track the transactions at the school level for student body, uh, uh, revenues and expenditures. The fund balance is assumed to be zero because we're expecting all the revenues to be spent in the, in the current year. It's not going to work out quite that way, but that's what the expectation is. Uh, the other funds you can see were the comparison to where we were when we adopted our budget, um, an increase in the building fund due, due to um, an increase in expected uh, rental income from the tent site. Cause of that, all the others are pretty similar to where they were if we adopted them. So, you know, we've heard about the current year. I want to move to, as we always do, a multi year projection. State requires us to look two years out, we look a little further. So let's talk about our multi year projections. And again, the state requires a, a three year forecast. During that three year forecast, uh, our projections indicate we'll stay in double digit reserves. Uh, we have a six year forecast that we do here internally in our district. Even in that um, six year forecast, we, we in the baseline projection, we expect to have double digit reserves. That even incorporates um, the parcel tax, which ends in after June 2025, not being renewed. Our assumption is that baseline forecast. You will see on succeeding slides some what if scenarios. Uh, talk about as an example, if we give an annual 2% salary increase, our reserves will drop below uh, our normal board policy target. What are the, some of the key assumptions in the baseline forecast? Assumptions are critical, right? They are, you know, they, they affect the variables which affect the forecast. You change the assumptions, the numbers are going to change, right? None of these numbers are going to come out exactly right. So we're assuming right now a 4% annual property tax growth. Okay. Uh, take a fairly conservative assumption given our recent even our history. Um, some slight enrollment growth. And why is that when we're seeing declining enrollment? Well, we have a uh, requirement to implement um, the universal TK program for all four year olds. So we're adding a new grade or 13th grade um, for us to cover, or the 14th, 14th grade for us to cover. Um, um, not us. Public education. Yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not us, but all the public schools in right. California. Um, so we have additional children coming in as a result of, I expect additional children coming in as a result of implementing the transitional kindergarten program over the next four years. 
we still have new housing stock um, in, in the Chitlin uh, Mountain View area. Uh, some of it's not yet fully built, some of it's already built. It is, it is um, housing stock, particularly apartments age, we tend to get more students coming from those units. So we have those two factors on the, on the enrollment plus side. We expect some families to return that left during the pandemic. Don't know how many that are going to be, how many will. Um, but we also have a larger cohort leaving our eighth, our upper grades, six, seven, eight, or are higher than our lower grades. So, so some some additions and some subtractions. So a projection of very slight enrollment growth. Uh, so as you look over the six-year period, we'll see some additional staffing because of enrollment growth. I had to make an assumption about the charter schools enrollment. So I um, it, have it peaking at 1111, which is the most recent uh, peak under our two-year agreement that has now been extended. So I have that remaining constant in the entire period. There are no cross-the-board races built into the baseline projection. Assume that the parcel tax expires, and we did not. I did not build in a, an automatic renewal. Certainly up for discussion over the next couple of years. And then a return to pre-pandemic level of some of the local revenue sources for use for these uh, facilities and rental income. So those are probably the most critical key assumptions, Brian. A uh, question, just because I can't remember. Yep. Um, do we see cola related? Cost increases. Uh, so, cola related cost increasing. So, cola is usually on the revenue side. Um, where cola would get us would be uh, if we want to keep pace with inflation on the expense side. But, but we have to make the choice. We don't see any uh, sort of automatic no. increase. Very little. Okay, thank you. Okay, move on to. Uh, talking about enrollment, I put together a little chart showing where our enrollment's been last three years on the first Wednesday in October. And with the uh, relatively flat, slight enrollment growth over the six year forecast. So, what do the reserves look like under the base baseline projection? Uh, you can see all this on the very last slide at the end that has the numbers, but you can see it graphically much clearer here. Basically, we stay in and around the 20% level with some growth as the tax growth continues to compound over time and significantly outpaces some of the offsetting expenditure. Randy, and as a reminder, the, in, in this uh, slide, the parcel tax expires after 2425? Correct. That's why there's a slight dip yes. in the last two years, or a slight dip from one year to the next year. So that's going back. I've run a number of what if scenarios um, regarding changing some of the assumptions. Most of these scenarios, um, it's kind of like one assumption changes, it's an independent variable, nothing else is changing at the same time. So, this one assumption has to do with um, the cost of technology. There's been discussions with our PGA leadership um, regarding should the district be paying for some technology that the PTA has paid for historically? So this is just taking the concept of the district paying the technology, paying essentially for computers for staff. So making some assumptions about how many staff members and what the cost is to replace, and making an assumption that it would need to be replaced over a five-year time if it's going to be remembered in the MacBook or something. Maybe good for five years, and then we need to replace it. So the estimated cost around six hundred thousand dollars. If we amortize that over five years, about one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, and it makes very little difference in terms of our projections. Just taking that, taking that into our budget. Not surprising when you have a you know seventy million dollar budget, one hundred twenty thousand dollars is going to be a bit of a scare. So that's a piece of information. Um, Probably want to have a little discussion about that later. Um, so this is the projection showing the annual two percent raise for employees, changing no other assumptions. Um, it does not incorporate 
compensate that $120,000 from the previous winners. So just to make clear, it's independent of each other. So then I did um, the same, same assumption of the 2% raise, but had the parcel tax being renewed in the last two years because that's where we saw the, the steepest drop in the previous slide. And it did bring our reserves back up just above, you know, right around the reserve target of 50%. And these are just what ifs for us to be thinking about over the next few years. Uh, another what if, looking at that annual 2% raise, but make, changing the assumption of tax growth from 4% to 5%. And with no parcel tax renewal, you can see that we maintain double digit reserves, a drop from the parcel tax, uh, if the parcel tax is not renewed, but still staying well above our 8 to 10% reserve target. Slide 22, I just want to point out that we're <laughs> so and this is another what if projection um, as you know there's been discussion at the uh, county board level about the bcs uh, not complying with the law current state law regarding mirroring the demographics of the school district that they, within which they reside and the Bullish Charter School has has its charter that runs through the 23-24 school year. One, I would say, extreme possibility would be that the county board could choose not to renew the charter. So if that were to happen, we would need to be planning for that. Hence why I'm running this projection, uh, this scenario. So if they decided not to renew the charter, I would expect we would see many families, but probably not all. Uh, return to enroll in the district. So the following chart shows you um, an assumption, the assumption here, if the charter did close, and assuming I ran a number of different scenarios, but I picked this one, which that was the highest number of percentage of students that would enroll in our district. Just as a placeholder, you could argue maybe it's 90%, in which case I could run a, a different scenario. Um, but this one shows 80% of the students currently at the charter school enrolling in the district. Uh, it assumes that all students could be housed at our existing campuses because those students, that number of students, which is around 800 or 850, um, we bring our enrollment up to even below where we were four or five years ago, and we have plenty of facility capacity in our existing campuses. So we would not need to add existing housing which means I don't think we would need to have the overhead of the principal, secretary, all that overhead cost of the new campus. So that's an assumption, right? You need to understand that assumption. Uh, and this is what would happen that actually uh, our reserves go up significantly as a result. Um, obviously, we probably need to dig a little deeper because there could be some, some costs, maybe traveling teachers or some other support costs that would go with having additional students, um, but, but that's getting into a little bit more of the micro level or at, at a higher level, I wanted to see, is the impact gonna be positive or negative? And it looks like it's significantly positive. Okay, those were the scenarios, the what if scenarios, just turning now to a little bit on property taxes are our major source of revenues. And the next two slides just kind of show the AV growth um, that you can barely, barely see. This is the current year. We're just about 4% growth in our assessed value for next year at this time, as of December. If we follow the trajectory of recent years, it seems likely we will be at least at 5% or more. And the next slide probably shows us a, a little bit easier. You can see the uh, the orangish colored bars on the left of where we are in December versus where we end up in July 1. So it seems pretty safe to think we're going to have growth, property tax growth of at least 4%. Uh, I think I'm getting 
And Randy, as a reminder, the, the relation of AV growth and property tax. Yeah, so they are not exactly equal, but they, they kind of mirror each other. It's usually, it's historically been within 1% of each other. Okay. Um, so, concluding slides. Again, we, our report shows that we have adequate reserves for the current year to fiscal year, so that um, I would recommend that we do approve the first item that's presented. I also want to point out that this part of this agenda item, um, not only do you have the state required format in this backup to this uh, report, it's sort of a lengthy document, uh, but there's also a new report required that identifies the reserve amount in excess of the state required 3% and what we what we need that money for. Um, it's kind of uh, interesting that uh, districts are supposed to have adequate reserves, but then they're asking you what you're going to do with the, the amount above the excess. Anyway, that's that's in your agenda packet just for your information. Um, that not only do I, is this an action item and I recommend you take action, but there are two questions here for you to discuss. One is about the assuming some of the technology costs. You may not have to make it, you may not make a decision tonight, but at least we start the discussion. And the other is, is there any other what if scenario you'd like me to run over the next few weeks and months to do our plan going forward? Uh, January is coming next month, and uh, we'll get the governor's proposal for the state budget. And, um, we'll have our second interim report in March. And before you know it, it will be June, and Sandra will be happily preparing an open budget. Sure, and we're excited with both of you as we present those. <laughs> Reminder when you look at the carryovers, um, one year to the next, the current year has one time carryovers built into it, but you will see the future years. And this last slide, which again you can see better on your computer, shows the actual numbers and summary form um, for the six year forecast. So, with that, I'm going to end my presentation. I have to answer questions. Before we get to questions, yeah, before we go to questions, I'm going to give public the um, trigger that if you have any questions for Randy that, or you want to make any comments, please raise your hand now. I'm going to go to the board for questions, clarifying questions. I have one. Didn't the state require us to start doing free lunches next year? And is that baked into your plans? Yes, the state is currently requiring us to do free lunches for all next year among other programs. Right. Um, there is no, there are no particular costs built in yet. Uh, there is also the theory behind this requirement that there will be some state money, but we have not heard specifically about that. Especially we're not very specific about additional funding. You have one person to raise their hand. Do we have any other questions from the board to clarify? Okay, good. John, you have three minutes. Let's go ahead. Go ahead, John. Are you having trouble logging in? Because we aren't hearing you on our end if you're speaking. You might be muted still. You want to unmute? Yeah. You know, after my 4,000th Zoom, you'd think I'd find the unmute button by now. <laughs> hey, I was having the same problem in reverse over here. Apologies. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure this was the right time to comment on the uh, technology and um, spending. Or if that should be done somewhere else, please advise. Go ahead. Okay, great. So I just, you know, a few things I wanted to call out in terms of uh, the technology spend is, is first I want to just do a big thank you to um, the district office staff and the trustees. Pandemic time has been grueling and you guys have excelled I think in some areas. We've excelled in then some, namely the budget reserves. Um, 
as you know, and I'll, I'll state for everyone's awareness, PTA organizations, and you know, we're not fundraising organizations by nature. Um, we're a community building organization that advocates for all children's education, especially our own. Um, the funds that we raise put forward for technology are, are no longer sustainable by the PTAs. Um, I think we've seen, especially through the pandemic time, technology is no longer a nice to have to augment the learning process. It's embedded in everything we do. Our teachers wouldn't be able to teach, our students wouldn't be able to learn. This is core to delivering not just a great education um, or an LASD education, but a core to delivering any education. And I think LASD bears the responsibility to provide this technology to our staff and, and students. Um, the years of fundraising to cover LASD, LASD technology responsibilities have also had a toll on PTA organizations. Um, you know, at the start of every year, we have a new leadership team in place that learns on the job, a job that I'll remind everyone is 100% unpaid volunteer work. Uh, several positions we are finding are full-time, 40 hour plus per week jobs, which are critical to creating the ideal environment for our children to learn. Um, we also create an environment for all teachers and staff that show how valued, appreciated, and how much of a critical component they are to our kids' success. Um, without them, we would be lost. Um, and I think that also leads a really, you know, it's a great part of why they have such a high job satisfaction. Um, but our PTAs are struggling. Many families have two working parents with two plus jobs. Um, for a lot of our families, there isn't time to volunteer at school. And where our amazing parents do volunteer, um, it's nearly impossible to dedicate 10 plus hours a week to a single operational position like finance um, or other things that really require rigor around the role, rigor process and um, you know, accountability. Um, for the years that we've spent on technology and hardware for teachers and kids, we haven't invested in our people process and technology to enable our PTA to operate as a sustainable 100% volunteer organization. Um, where we have invested technology, it's been grassroots efforts utilizing nonprofit free technology like Google Workspace for nonprofits. I actually am personally implementing that one. Um, and our roadmap includes things like Octa Single Sign-On, DocuSign, Quicken, Twilio, other communication tools that will really enhance parent engagement and decrease the administrative burden on our PTA. And we're asking LASD for help with this. These are a lot of technologies that are already in place at LASD. It would be great to have the district spearhead something that would bring the PTAs from a technology perspective, a people process technology perspective forward. Because we have seven elementaries, two middles, and that's a, nine different times that we do the same identical processes. And from a volunteer organization, which is critical to making this district run, it's just a little bit too much for us to take on. So we're asking for your help and appreciate it. And thanks for your extra time. I yield. I yield my negative time. <laughs> Any other comments? Seeing none, I'm going to close the uh, public comment. Randy, can you go back to slide 27? Because I think that's where you had stuff that you wanted us to do. The number is just Clark. Yeah. Ah, ha, <laughs> so, do you, have, do you have any way you want us to address this? Do you just want to deal with the questions first, or do you want us to uh, deal with the interim report? approval or disapproval and then move forward. I think you should address the questions before you take action on the okay. item and Great. close the item if you actually have Great. So do you want to start with the assumption of technology costs of moving that over from the PTAs over to the board coverage or the district coverage? Comments on that Travis for discussion. I can start. Um, I in, in full support of uh, the district uh, taking over the technology box. Um, having been, oh yeah, sorry. I'm in full, uh, I'm not loud enough for one. <laughs> <laughs> <That's the chair. laughs> no, it's your voice. <laughs> um, I'm in full support of us taking on, uh, the, the dis district taking on the tech uh, spend uh, away from uh, the PTAs. Having been on the front line as a PTA uh, leader, I did know how much uh, fundraising we had to do. And it, it was a lot and it was strenuous. And it, as John said, uh, it could be a 40 hour a week uh, job and, and they get paid even less than we do. Um, so, which we don't get paid that much at all. Um, anyway, uh, so I support it and in, in, in your, you know, your show, the uh, slide you had really showed 
uh, how much of a drop in the bucket it is. Um, while it is a drop in our bucket. But the study showed, showed staff only, and, and John's asking us to take over student use as well. I'm right now just uh, supporting uh, the staff only. I think we can research uh, those tools, but um, I think taking away the tech um, that is several, can be several, uh, at least a hundred thousand per PTA sure. uh, that they're not fundraising that they could um, put together. Uh, they could fundraise a little bit for that, uh, but we can look to see if we can at least find better uh, uh, tools for them that perhaps that they could pay less for together. Um, but I think some PTAs may want to do things differently, and we want to let them do things the way they want. So, so I, I heard the software was the end, but I also yeah. heard him asking about hardware projections. Is that the huge expense of that to not look at the previous oh. projections? That was staff oh, just only. Staff? Yeah. So this is just, oh. yeah, this is just one component yeah. rather than starting to kind of work. Oh, I missed that. It. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to know what it, I, I would like to know. A little more about, about what that would look students. like. Is there a phase out? Because I know some one of the things we have proved, proved in the consent items was a huge technology sunsetting. Yeah. You know, if you could understand how that got replaced, it got replaced. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was where I was going to. But let's get other people talk. Sorry. Yeah. So um, I do like the idea of our district moving in the direction of assuming technology costs, not just for staff, but for our students, uh, including, you know, hot spots and anything to make it more equitable and more accessible. Um, I think that we should consider, and I'm not sure at what point we consider this, but there are some positive lessons learned from the pandemic. I don't think we'll ever go back to a completely non, you know, I don't know. You know, like, like I know we used technology before the pandemic, but there's some good things that came out of the pandemic in terms of that. So I'd like to know, um, I guess I'm just reiterating, I'd like to know what it would cost to gradually move in that direction. And then also, um, what would be the cost of maintenance and like renewing contracts and all of that stuff? Steve, it might take a time to show the slide, just a little background, um, historical background. So, pretty much all of the technology historically has been provided by the PTAs. Including the infrastructure in school. All the infrastructure was built by PTAs for volunteer teachers in, 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 to, from the beginning. Um, more recently, we've taken over, at least deliberately taken over, most of the infrastructure costs. Um, but we have not taken over the, the things, right? The computers, um, the, the Wi Fi, uh, access points, et cetera. And it's, it's the it's the individual units and we get the licensing agreements too uh, for some of the software that we have not seen the cost of. So we're just sort of thinking about maybe gradually. Yeah, so I just do want to say something history, right? Because when we talk about our funding, right, sort of in general, not just about technology, but about anything, the way we always build it is as a base program, right, that the district pays for, and then the foundation raises money, which we use to expand that program beyond the just bare bones. And then the PTAs are supposed to provide extra money on a site basis, right, things that a particular site might want to do. And it seems to me that technology has sort of fallen outside of that paradigm, because at about the same time that we were adopting technology as a district, like a decade ago, the budget fell apart and we were asking PTAs to pitch in in ways that we had not before that. And we've never really gotten out of that paradigm, but you know, I think when you look at the projections that you've done, Randy, I think now is the time to get back out of that paradigm. And so I'd actually, I'd like to suggest that we go a little farther than staff technology, because I think as part of putting this budget together, we should do that base enhanced extra work to figure out what really is required at a base level for our program. And then what's perhaps extra that the foundation might be interested in funding, if any, 
and then what is site specific for the PTA? Because I think we just, it has to be set up so that if a particular PTA completely falls apart or the treasurer runs off with a bank account or something, the education we provide our students doesn't suffer, right? And so to me, that's what the logical way to sort of start to look at it. I mean, I'm in favor of the district taking on those expenses as fast as prudently possible, but it seems to me that the first step is figuring out what those levels are because as far as I know, the board has never actually promulgated the policy of are we a one to one device district? Like the various, I think we probably are or we're close to the various schools. It depends on the school. But it depends on the school, it depends on the grade level. I think we need to have a policy and we need to establish those things so that we can then see what it would cost, understand what the base cost is with the enhanced cost. Yeah, and I think we'll doing in doing that, I think we're gonna have to understand also that knowing that our schools are in different places. Mm -hmm. That, right. mean, that may mean that the baseline is more than some schools currently have, and it will be less than other schools. Well, and if, right. if it's more, then that's that's a problem, right? Like I, I mean, if, if we decide the baseline is more than schools currently have, then like that's that's a problem because then we're not we're not providing the same program, right. the same base program, right, everywhere. And we've we've had these problems in the past when I was in the I think almost all of us have been in the PTA. At some point in our careers, and we've had, I've seen cases where staff laptop purchasing fell off the agenda for a few years, and we've had staff at some schools with significantly yep. underpowered laptops compared to other schools, and that's just you know so, something that I think we're past the point where that's reasonable. So, um, so anyway, that's my suggestion, and I'm I'm certainly in favor not only of that, but I I think I've probably on the aggressive side in terms of being willing for the district to assume the resulting cost. So why don't I bring, apart from Shelly, why don't I bring some, some projections back maybe in January and mm -hmm. start looking at this? That'd be great. Uh, thank you, Randy. Just um, kind of building off what Brian said, it kind of made me remember when I was a parent at Almond, uh, a whole bunch of Chromebooks were donated by a parent who worked at Google. A whole bunch of iPads were donated by a parent who worked at Apple. We had Cisco routers because there's a parent, the parents use their Cisco discount. I just find that it's very inconsistent to me. And if the district took over technology, we could all have consistency across the board. So. And easier, hopefully, easier management for yeah. the management. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I'd like to add is in my my knowledge of PTAs is quite old, it's at least six years old. Um, but I do remember that a lot of PTAs had uh, difficulty sometimes in spending all the funds that they collected. And so they rolled over every year, uh, sometimes with uh, fairly large sums of money in the bank. And so we probably need to. So just keep track of that in the back of our minds. Uh, I, I don't disagree with basically with anything that's been said. I just uh, want people to remember that PTAs don't always have uh, the wherewithal to spend a little bit. Now, things it's also been a practice for yeah. them. It, yeah. it, it, yeah. Really, but you yeah, got to be careful not to step on that yeah. too. So this is, as I said, this is information that's at least six yeah. years old. So yeah. So I think what, if I'm hearing you guys correctly, there's it's a two-step process here. One is to get to get to, from a, a curriculum point of view, what is what is required at each grade level. I don't think we've ever established that as per, and and what what do we think is baseline for that to make it work. And then after we understand that, it's going to be a budget impact of that effort, right? Mm -hmm. And there'll be a conversation at both both. Give me something more because you were really getting quiet down there. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I think those are the two things we're asking for. To come back in January might be aggressive, but sooner rather than later would be great. Um, in terms of scenarios, obviously the scenarios that make sense, um, you know, depending on the magnitude of the cost and that kind of thing. Also, scenarios in terms of how we might pay for it, I would like to see because. Yeah. Um, Computer technology, I believe, is potentially capitalizable. So, um, it's not something that has to, unlike teacher salaries, it's not something that has to be paid out of the general fund. Um, the other comment that I just want to make, responding to a little bit to Vladimir's comment about fundraising, is, and I, I think one of the things John was trying to express is that our PTAs have, in effect, become fundraising 
organizations. And I think that has actually had an equity impact because are new to the school and you look at the PTA, it's someplace that it doesn't look like you belong in on the executive board of the PTA unless you're comfortable helping to run a six figure fundraising campaign over the course of the year. And I think that, you know, at, I've seen it firsthand at Santa Rita, I'm sure, well, I can guess that it applies elsewhere that our PTAs have not reflected the diversity of our schools because sort of see what the PTA president and vice president spend all their time doing, it's talking about fundraising. And so that drives off people who don't care about money, but it also drives off people who aren't comfortable dealing with fundraising. And so that's one of the reasons that I would like to see that um, culture change. And, you know, yes, we can't stop a PTA from throwing a big fundraiser and raising $100,000, but we need to make it so that we don't expect, I think, that from the district end. And, if they raise more money than they can spend, that's like their organizational problem, not our organization. And also, for those of you, I think probably all board members are aware, but in case you're not, the um, LAEF, Heather McDonald at LAEF, has been in talks with PTA leadership also to try to sort of rationalize and streamline, streamline the fundraising. And so, to the extent that there is exuberant financial exuberance in our community, we can try to capture that in a way that sort of flows to the entire district rather than to individual school sites. Uh, I'd like to make some comments about some other things yeah. that we have here. Uh, first one is about the, uh, the reserve level. Uh, my personal feeling is that we should keep a reserve level of between 15 and 20 percent, roughly twice as much as the board level thinks uh, reserve level to be. And I just want to point out that a 20% reserve is about seven weeks worth of salary, uh, assuming that we have no other expenses. If we do have other expenses, it's going to be something less than, than seven weeks. And uh, a reserve, a healthy reserve, uh, allows us to do uh, three things that were mentioned in the CSBA uh, conference. One is uh, it gives us time to react to do different things, it gives us time to plan. And it gives us time to implement things without being under the gun. So I, I really like to see, uh, I'm happy with large reserves. And I think that we uh, are running right on the edge, with eight to 10%. My personal feeling is that we're running right on the edge of uh, what, is, what is prudent. So that's my two cents. I get to say this once a year. <laughs> And so just to move this along, because I know somebody needs to leave. But what, what, are there any what if scenarios you'd like us to think about tonight? If not, you can always want to raise them to Jeff later. But. Yep. Okay, you don't need to. Jeff, for me, I, I think that your experience, um, you pick out the most likely, most important, uh, most impactful uh, scenarios. So I'm, I'm happy with the ones that you, uh, you look at. I like the scenarios too. I think we should just combine a couple of them together to show what, what that impact um, the only, is. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm fine. Done. Um, sorry. Uh, the only, uh, if you want to combine things, then I think you should add in, uh, <laughs> should add in probabilities. What's the probability this will happen and that will happen together? And, and that's a much more difficult problem. And that's uh, that's to do that well is really good. Anything else? Then we do have one um, one action that we do have to take tonight, which is to approve the first interim report as presented. Can I get a motion for that? So moved. Second. Uh, moved and Shally seconded. Is there any other further discussion on that piece of? Hearing none, can we have a vote? All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? You cast five zero. Thank you. Ooh. Item number six consideration of approval of findings and amendments to the joint use agreement with the Los Altos Education Foundation, LEN. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, I think it's a 
last board meeting, we had a, a one month extension of the current lease with the South Southwest Educational Foundation for facilities there at the district office. Uh, and so now that extension is up in December. So you have in front of you tonight a, a, a amendment to the joint use agreement that we have with them for another five year, basically lease term. Uh, no, no increase in the cost. Uh, but as part of that, you also need to understand it's written in the uh, rationale for the agenda item about the findings that the foundation will not, when you read it, interfere with the educational program or activities of, the district, of any district school or class conducted on the property. Uh, will not unduly disrupt the residents of the surrounding neighborhood and will not jeopardize the safety of the children of the property. I think those are fair findings for you to make tonight. Um, and hopefully you will make those findings and approve the renewal of this um, five-year lease agreement with the Los Altos Educational Foundation, which is which we talked about critical to the success of our programs in the district. Okay, before I open up any questions for Randy, if anyone wants to comment on this agenda item, please raise your hand now. Anybody have any questions for Randy on what he's proposing or the agreement as presented? And I don't see any hands raised either, so I'm going to close public comment. Any further discussion on this item? So I'm going to need a motion to um, adopt the following findings and approval for the First Amendment to the Joint Use Agreement from the Los Altos Education Foundation. The findings are as follows. Proposal First Amendment will not interfere with education program activities in any district program or any activities of any district school or class conducted at the Covington Elementary School site and duly disrupt the residents of the surrounding neighborhood or jeopardize the safety of children on the property. Can I get a motion to? So moved. Second. Vladimir moved. Shelly seconded. Any other comments or questions? <clears throat> Not seeing any. Can I get a vote? All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Passes by vote. I think we're at the last and it's actually an action item again. Appointment of citizen appointment to the citizen advisory committee for finance. Randy. Yes, thank you. Um, we have a few vacancies on our citizens advisory committee for finance and four advisory committees. Uh, very recently, uh, I think the last meeting you were appointed um uh, to that committee. Um, and tonight we're bringing to you the appointment, uh, the proposed appointment of John Bennett, who you heard from earlier tonight, as an at-large member to the committee. Uh, our membership uh, subcommittee of that CACF full committee has been working hard to find um, qualified, interested people who would be uh, good on that committee. Um, so Kent's found Pei Pei and John. John would fill a interesting slot being a, uh, a, a representative from the North of El Camino neighborhood on our community. So he'd be singularly the only one who lives in that area. Um, so the committee, the committee's recommending, I'm recommending that you appoint John Bennett to the CACM finance. Great. Before I have a discussion, if anybody would like to make a comment on this, please raise your hand. Any comments, questions from the board? I just like that he listed his occupation as Carol Dad. <laughs> Go, John. <laughs> Not seeing any hands raised for public comments. I close that portion. Any further discussion? I need a I need a motion to approve John Bennett to be added to the Citizens Committee Advisory Committee for Finance. So moved. Vladimir. Second. Second. Sally. I have a first from Vladimir, a second from Sally to. John Bennett's appointment. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, that passes 5-0. Congratulations, John. Yeah. yeah, congratulations, John. Thank you. Hey. Well, now to board and administration comments. Sandra? Sure, just two things. Uh, last Friday, I had the pleasure of talking with our PTA leadership about our wellness committee that will be convening in January as we look to go through the process of adopting our comprehensive sexuality education curriculum. So I think in uh, superintendent's update and newsletter that went out today, kind of a call to families, to parents who are looking for some volunteers. 
um, you serve on that committee, which is terrific, and we're wrangling up our staff volunteers as well. And then uh, tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to the first of three universal TK pre-K uh, training sessions that the county is providing to really help us better understand um, what the requirements are and how our county and partners can work together um, to develop a really great universal TK program. So it should be very interesting. Andy? All right, just, just one. Um, Wednesday, uh, I have a, a quarterly meeting with our um, bond oversight committee, and that'll be the first meeting for two new representatives that you appointed just a short while ago, uh, Aaron Sachs and Michelle Verba. So um, that's all I have. Is there anything else? Um, we have a, a Kinder information night coming up on Wednesday evening virtually. So that's a big event. Looking forward to that. Sandra and I will be uh, it off with Sarah Stern's help. Um, I'm very excited to report that um, we had a, a great CSBA conference uh, uh, last week, was it? Between the last board meeting and this current one, I concentrated mostly on finance where the money was coming from, where the money was going, and stuff like that. And so hopefully I'll be able to bring some of that knowledge back to Randy, uh, who will no doubt be very excited to receive that knowledge. <laughs> so that's all I have. Uh, also at CSBA, I focused on uh, communications sessions um, and some equity in education sessions. Uh, from those sessions, I learned that we're kicking butt in the education, um, in equity in education, really doing a wonderful job. I, I felt like we could be teaching those and we should uh, should start submitting stuff uh, for CSBA because uh, comparatively, we were, we're, we were quite, quite amazing. Um, and communication, um, we can always learn. Um, but in some respects, yes, we were doing better than some too, but I learned some stuff from them too. I also, uh, twice a year, I get to go to this Berman Education Roundtable with trustees and different education-related people. It's done through Zoom. Uh, my main focus with him was to tell him that we don't want unfunded, unfunded mandates. And yes, we love one-time monies, but we would prefer them to be perpetual. So that was uh, what I kept on hitting. He said, what did you think of the one-time money? So I, uh, they're great, but like, we'd like them to continue. <laughs> so I, I hit that home. And uh, today I sent out a message to the county uh, supervisors about um, on their agenda, they have this extending broadband in the county. Um, our Dick, the Dick Digital Equity Collaborative was asking us to send messages. I think we should all try to send individual yeah, messages uh, in support of it. They're making sure there's more broadband for our underserved uh, in the community. So, anyway, that's it. So, the record should note that she was also excited. Yeah, yeah excited. I was super excited. Yeah, it's your turn to be excited. Um, <laughs> very excited. I had, um, I actually also had a call with some of the member Berman. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I made a lot of the same points yeah. that you made. Um, Friday, I was at the uh, LASD PTA leadership meeting. Uh, as I mentioned, there's some discussions between the foundation and the PTA about kind of make the fundraising asks less confusing and, and hopefully at least equally, if not more lucrative. Um, I was also at the um, conference, um, and Jeff and I actually have a call with Senator Becker um, on Friday. So we'll make all those same points again. The most, one of the interesting things at the conference was there is actually federal legislation that's been introduced to fully fund um, IDEA, the Special Ed Act, basically. Um, and I sent the references to you, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind forwarding them out to the rest of the trustees because Congresswoman Eshu has not yet agreed to co sponsor the House version. So I think oh. we should all reach out to her office and generously. Encourage her. Um, it's actually a little bit uh, perplexing how few of the California representatives have currently signed on to co sponsor that bill. So, uh, 
I had a great time at CSBA. It's one of, it, it is my favorite conference. It's so great to uh, connect with other school board members from around the state. Um, and I agree with Jessica. I think that we have so much expertise, and I mean that in a very helpful way. So many things that we do that would be great to share out with the rest of the state. Um, I am also very humbled and pleased to announce that um, last Thursday, I was elected to the board of the Asian Pacific Islander School Board Members Association. Um, thank you. We are, we are a statewide body, actually, and um, we have very close uh, ties with CDE, uh, Department of Education. We worked on the Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum, which is one thing that we had done, and I contributed to the South Asian lesson plans for that. And when I was doing that, what I learned is that a lot of people don't understand how damaging the model of minority it really is. Uh, when you put someone up as the model minority, what you're saying is that someone else is not. And so this is very damaging, I think, for this group of kids and this group of kids. And I believe that uh, racism is not just about who you let in, but also who you keep out. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a double-edged sword. And so um, I'm really excited because I take a lot of the values, all about the LASD with me when I speak on this board about equity and inclusion and diversity. And so, thank you. The, the piece that I kind of focused in because of my involvement with Jack was the mental health portion. And Brian saw the same presentation I did with Stanislaus County and the, mm -hmm. the thing they put together at a county level. And certainly getting that in front of the county, I think makes a lot of sense. Because I saw value in that, especially for the adults uh, and for the staff. And um, one of the big takeaways was mental health supports kind of start kind of the top down. So adults have to be in a good space, mental health wise, to help kids achieve mental health. So making sure that, that we've got those supports and trust in place. With that said, I think we're adjourned. Thank you. Good job, Steve. Steve, that was great. <laughs>